Hello, welcome to the Royal Armouries. My name is Tristan Langlois, I'm the Head of Interpretation, and we are about to explore our Field of Cloth of Gold exhibition, half finished because of the current circumstances. The Field of Cloth of Gold was uh, an event that took place 500 years ago to the year, in fact in June, we'll be marking the 500th anniversary of it, uh, and it was a meeting between King Henry VIII and Francis I, in which King Henry VIII essentially set his stamp on the world stage and trying to bring peace to all of Europe. Unfortunately, of course, we've not been able to complete our exhibition, but that does open doors, literally, uh, as well as metaphorically. And I'm here with Anna Ward, who is our interpretation manager, and we're going to go and have a look at the exhibition, a behind the scenes tour. So we're standing in front of one of the few parts that we managed to finish. And what we're going to do is take you inside and show you the exhibition as it stands. So as you can see, quite a few empty cases, but the build, the design, uh, the idea, the story of the exhibition is here, just missing that vital component of the objects. So it's taken us quite a while to get to this point even. I think yeah, original but, planning started. I think our first meeting was in December of 2017, before you, before you even started on the project. Yeah. And in fact, it's the first time we sat down to think through whether we could do the tour actually at, at, at that uh, point. Um, and and the, well, what I, I suppose I'm always surprised by just how long it, it takes to plan exhibitions. And I suppose, would you say it's, the, is it the objects or the, or the or, or cases or what, what, what takes the time, I suppose, would be my question. Mm, that, that's a good question. There's so many elements that have to fit together. So, um, obviously the curators who, who aren't represented here today, but have spent a great deal of time planning which objects will go into which cases. Around that, we have to build a story mm. to, to link the objects together and explain to people why we're putting that series of objects together. Then we have to create text and interpretation. Um, text is only one form of interpretation, but that's, that's actually the only method of interpretation you can see at the moment. That takes a long time. Mm. Um, the cases were actually mostly already at the museum or in storage. So that was a fairly straightforward job to organise, not to say, it, I think the building of these cases took in total probably four or five days and we had to move them in from off site. That was the job of our technicians. What's great about seeing the exhibition in this stage is that you'll see a lot of the work of the exhibition, sorry, the work of the technicians. Mm -hmm. Normally the work of the technicians disappears, it's made to. Like this actually over here, if you yeah. come over here. This will all be glossy and wonderful eventually, but at the moment it's, it's half finished. As I recall, this is about the, the preparations, will be about the preparations for the Field of Cloth of Gold, because of course thousands of knights were gathered together by both the King of France and the King of England, and of course they had to get pull, pull together all the resources that were needed to stage this massive joust come summit meeting. Uh, and all of that will be expressed in this amazing interactive that uh, we haven't yet finished. But you can see all the industry that's gone into building up the, the, the what will be infographics and handling objects, and eventually an AV which will run uh, over here. Um, and and you're and you're right that, uh, that, that generally when you visit an exhibition like this, you don't, you don't see any of that. It's, it's, it's the graceful swan rather than the frantically paddling feet uh, underneath. Speaking of frantic paddling, one of the things that we particularly confronted in the last just couple of weeks has been about loans, because actually that's yeah, loans from anywhere else, particularly international loans, as we were planning to, to have, that takes literally months and months to, yeah. to, to process, and yeah. so the loans were amongst the first things that we started planning what we need, actually, because yeah. the stuff that we have on site is, is you know, that's ours, we, we can put it in, but if it's someone else's, that's much, much more complicated. And in, in this case, we're supposed to be two of our major yeah. loans. Yes. So for a start, the work happens to identify what objects could be available anywhere in the world to support our story. Um, and it, the curators found these two amazing objects signed by Francis I of France and Henry VIII of England that agreed to the two kings meeting. So one of the documents is in France, 
ones in England. The curators decided that obviously they'd be great to tell the story. Then our registrar had to work to negotiate with the lenders mm -hmm. um, to agree for them to let us look after their objects in effect. Then the designers had to build a case. And, which and we had to be where they went as well. Yeah. Because because they're archives, and archives, unlike other kinds of material, are particularly sensitive to the effects light. of the light. Yeah. So we couldn't just put them in a case anyway, even if we wanted to, from a story point of view, if we wanted to stick them over there somewhere, we, we weren't able to do that. We really the lenders that maybe put, put it kept not just in the right kind of case and the right kind of environmental condition, but incidentally, that's what that white thing in the case is. Yeah. That's a monitor which our collection services team have put in there to be able to measure the stability for things like temperature and humidity and um, well, it's mainly that actually, their temperature and yeah. humidity. Yeah. Um, because all of those, it, it's not so much the um, the level of humidity and temperature, it's fluctuations that, that, do, all, that, that do the damage. Light, on the other hand, it's, it's to do with levels. Um, so to, uh, effectively, we have to put the archives in the darkest corner, but while at the same yeah. time lighting them sufficiently, the visitors can see them. And, uh, and also making sure that their position in the exhibition makes sense to the story. Yeah. Yeah. So all of those elements have to come together, and they all did. We just we got this case, um, we've written the story for this case, and chosen appropriate interpretation to make sense of the objects that are in this case. Mm. And the only thing that's missing is, is the objects. The objects. Themselves. <laughs> Now, objects, th these objects are fairly straightforward to, to mount uh, because they are pieces of parchment, so as long as they're flat and not at too steep an angle, that's fine. Uh, a lot of our objects, obviously, are, are, are armour, and, and that's more complicated to mount, which makes me think of these things over here, which is the other thing that takes time and expertise. Yeah. So over here we have this forest of metal work. What are, what are these, Anna? <laughs> This is, this We're trying is actually, to work out what, what corresponds to what. <laughs> this is a treat for us even to see because we don't we don't normally um, get to see these undressed, if you like. All of the objects, <laughs> all of the objects that you'll see in the cases live on different types of mounts. And our technicians internally at the Royal Armouries, we don't. It's not a service that we buy in, but work for many hours to create these these mounts. I mean, I can guess that this one is going to be for a, a, a horse armour. Um, we've got two really beautiful armours that were made to protect horses that both belong to Henry VIII. Yeah. Yeah, one, one in an Italian style and one in a Burgundian style. So that's what this one is. Um, in terms of these, they're just weird and wonderful, aren't they? Was there certainly helmets in the exhibition and, uh, and uh, what, gauntlets, different, gauntlets, different parts, different parts of, of the armour for the body and the, and the upper body? And obviously swords as well, and spears. In fact, we do have a couple of spears. The spears have gone in. Yeah, they're so actually mounted. You can see them mounted up there. So those are what are described in the archives as puncheon spears. So when the king of... In fact, one of the, one of the rare points in the actual tournament where the kings fought each other, uh, because obviously that was very closely controlled because they didn't want to cause a diplomatic incident, was fighting the barriers, as they, as they may call it. Um, and they fought with swords and they fought with uh, spears and, and these are spears from that period uh, illustrating that point. So those ones have gone in. This was this is a whole horse over yeah. here. I'm always intrigued by the fact that the kind of meta, um, metallurgy expertise or metalworking expertise that our technicians are using in order to create these things isn't so very remote from the kind of metalworking expertise that was used to make the armour in the first place. Yeah, um, that's right. So uh, that's so. The, so this looks a lot like what's going to go in a sense. What's going to go in the case? Except it's, it's everything but the object. Yeah, and and I mean just to fill you in with a bit of the stories, we, we've got a bit of the story of the exhibition right here. You can see that Tristan's standing over a banner on the floor. I don't know if you can. Sorry, what? Um, there's a banner. There's a mount. There's objects in the case. There's a photograph behind it. And every single one of those elements took a, um, has a story behind it and took a lot of planning. So the photograph that's along the back of the case um, took two days of shooting um, and two of our live interpreters who wore the tonlet armour which weighs about eight stone and they wore it each time for about three hours each. Um, it was a long day and, and a difficult shoot but it resulted in this amazing graphic which the idea is that it suggests the movement and the excitement of the, um, of the foot combat. 
Um, and we've already talked about the mount. The banner on the floor tells the story of how things go wrong in exhibitions. <laughs> so this banner was supposed to be one of the ones that you can see around the top. Um, and when it was printed, the text on it, when it was hung, the text was, was too high. Um, obviously we work within restraints here um, so that people can actually see and read the text is our hope. <laughs> Not only can they see and read it, but then hopefully they'll understand it and enjoy it, and that's a whole other level. But an immediate priority is getting it into a place where they can see it and read it. This text was presented too high, so very tall people would be able to see it and read it, but um, people of average height wouldn't be able to, so we had to take the whole thing down, reprint it and start again. Um, so we don't know quite what we're going to do with that banner, but it just tells you one of the stories um, behind mm. putting on an exhibition and how things can go wrong. Right. Thankfully, one of the ones. One of the ones, well. That didn't go wrong. Oh, yes, actually, this is um, an extraordinary graphic. We've, you, you'll notice that there's a huge map of all of Europe on the floor. It may be a bit difficult to see the whole thing. In some ways, we can go upstairs and have a look, at, look, look down on it. Yeah. Um, so, for the, for the viewers, we, we are currently about here. <laughs> um, but the, we haven't put everywhere in, in Tudor Europe on the map, just the, just, just the parts of, the, of Europe that were important to the story, essentially, which for, for Henry, at least, was where the capital was, where his palaces were, which is in London, obviously. And the Field of Cloth of Gold location itself, because obviously not many people have heard of the Field of Cloth of Gold, even fewer people have heard of the towns of Guine and Ardre in uh, north uh, uh, eastern France, where it took place. But the, just by the by, the, the reason why it took place in France was because while historically uh, 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 English kings uh, had also ruled large chunks of France back in the 13th and 14th and 15th uh, centuries, by the time Henry VIII was on the throne, uh, the bit of France that he ruled was, was that bit, mm -hmm. just that bit there. Uh, and so the decision was taken to, to hold it, hold the event on the French continent, but on English soil, essentially, which meant that you had to have it, you had to have it in the kind of the no man's land on, on the border, the land border uh, between uh, France and England. But what was the objective? So we've got a big map of the world, but, what we, but, but why, why do we, remind me why we have a big map of the world. I love it, but why do we have a big map of the world? So the, the field of cloth of gold, a bit like this exhibition, the event itself 500 years ago took years of diplomatic effort and planning. About two and a half years, actually, about the same time it's taken us to plan this yeah. actual exhibition. Oh no, I feel, I feel bad now because that was big and this is little. <laughs> <laughs> but it's big for us. Um, and uh, before coronavirus took over all of the news, big stories uh, was Brexit and the European situation. And again, there's real similarities between what was happening mm. um, then and what's happening now in terms of negotiations on our relationship. England's relationship, that is, with Europe. Mm. Henry really wanted to make a great big show of himself in Europe and put his, uh, I don't know. I want to say imprimatur, but that's quite a complicated word. I mean, I mean, his stamp, his mark. <laughs> he wanted to stand centre stage, I suppose you could say. Yeah. And I guess that's, 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 what, that's why this guy is over here, because yeah. this is kind of the star of the, the, star of the show. So, so we laid Europe on yeah. as the stage, the scene is set, there are diplomatic discussions going on in Europe between the leaders of Europe. There is also a risk of war and some of the main players with the, with the um, unsettled situation in Europe at that time are um, pictured around and above, almost as if they're looking over and watching and paying attention to what Henry and Francis are doing. The, there are situations bubbling up all over Europe. So Europe is the foundation, and Henry wants to place himself smack bang in the middle of Europe. So what we've done is placed the closest thing we have to Henry, which is his armour. Or at least the moment, most of his armour. Yeah, <laughs> right at the centre of the European map. So again, you've got a real chance here to see something that you very rarely see, which is a half, a half um, displayed armour. When you come to the exhibition, and it'll be open. Um, his arms will be in place and his shoulder protection. Um, so it's a bit of a treat really to see it half dressed because there's some sections that you won't be able to see when it's fully dressed. But this armour, it's great that this is the one or the one of the few objects that's in 
um, was made for and worn by King Henry VIII at the Field of Pot of Gold 500 years ago. The early story of our exhibition tells how Henry wanted to make world-class armours, um, and this was one of was the world-class armour that he managed to make, or it's one of them. And one of the uh, maybe there's an, an irony here. So if you think of the, the organisers of the Field of Pot of Gold spending two years planning this massive uh, okay. event, and things go wrong, yes. as things have gone wrong for us, uh, and it, it's not quite directly analogous, but there was a, a hiccup along the route because this was never intended to be the armour that Henry wore, was it, as I, as I recall? No, that's absolutely right. They'd spent many, many a month, we're not quite sure how long they'd spent, making a completely different armour to this, with the intention that Henry would turn up with um, a fully enclosing armour, which will also be on display later, um, that would have shown absolutely technical brilliance um, to everybody in Europe and would have turned heads all over Europe. However, what Tristan was saying about it took place in France, uh, it took place, sorry, on English soil, the French were able to set the rules. And really not long before everybody was due to go over, they changed the rules and Henry's brand new armour couldn't be worn. So they had to scramble around, having sent half of the men from the armoury already over to Calais, they had to scramble around and create this armour, which was the one that he ended up using. So actually like a snag. Yeah. <laughs> they hit a snag and they solved it, and this was how they solved it. So this was problem solving. So this armour um, was only partly made new. Um, there's a little diagram to explain which bits are new and which bits were recycled, as we've said. Um, the tomlet skirt, which is obviously the skirt, was made new, and the pauldrons, the shoulder parts, which are yet to be placed on this armour, were made new, and the rest they scrambled around, found, redecorated, and made it work, so that on the day, everybody still yeah. went wow when Henry came out in this armour. And there is, a, there is a clue, I know we have other footage of, of, of one of the clues, so I'm not going to talk about that. There's another clue, which I don't think we do have any footage of, which is if you look right down here, it might be a bit difficult to see in the gloom, but those slots on the back of uh, the heels, essentially, of the, uh, the armour there, they tell us that those were designed, uh, that the, the, the armour was designed for spurs, uh, the, the metal pronged attachments that uh, were uh, used to goad horses into feats of speed. Of course, uh, that tells us that they were uh, intended to be used on horseback, and, and this is foot combat armour. So uh, it's evidence, therefore, that uh, presumably they thought, well, the king will never notice. It's right at the back, at the bottom. He'll never, he'll never see this. Uh, we can get away with it. So that's one of so a few clues. But for the other clues, you just have to come and we open yes. the show, which we will at some point. Yeah when we open. But then to give you, obviously we've shown you a lot of things that are not here and a lot of things that you have to imagine. So we'll show you a couple of things that, you, um, that should give you an idea of what we're trying to talk about. So there's an illustration here that we've had made for the exhibition, which shows, just right here Robbie, and that shows what this armour may have looked like actually at the Field of Cloth of Gold. So you can see it's a lot more colourful than it, than it is now um, and a lot more decorated. And then, if you just turn around, you can see the painting through the case here of the Field of Cloth of Gold. Now, obviously, <laughs> there wasn't photography at the time, uh, and paintings took quite a while to make. So it's not actually contemporaneous to the event. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a depiction of the event as it happened. But this was um, painted, I'm checking to see the date. 1543, I believe. Um, from accounts of the event. Mm -hmm. So you can see Henry is depicted several times. I don't know how much you can see, but Henry is depicted several times. Um, we have images of um, the two kings meeting, which I think is what you're looking at now, the two kings jousting, um, which is up here, the queen's watching on. Well, actually, the kings are watching there, but the joust is happening. Um, people eating, the amazing buildings that were, that were built. Um, you know, in the middle of a field, the tents and the field of cloth, the cloth of gold, sorry, where the field of cloth of gold, the name of the event comes from, and Henry arriving with his great retinue. Yeah, no one, no one self isolating in this picture. No. <laughs> I confess my, my favourite bit of the paint, painting is, is actually down here, um, where uh, 
the fountain, I mean, we know from the accounts that this actually happened, that uh, fountains were built that ran with wine. It was an extraordinarily progressive idea, but the uh, painter has not fought shy of the fact that there are, there are obviously, wine is a, is, a, is a great thing. Uh, according to some, not for everybody, of course, and the consequences of uh, uh, overconsumption uh, are, are this, apparent this here. This so well. No, there's... Uh, <laughs> So we can all relate. Maybe it's just me that can relate to that. I hope it's not just me that can relate, <laughs> uh, relate to that. And again, I think this is one of the powers of exhibitions. Obviously, uh, this is not the real painting, otherwise we wouldn't be laying our hands on it. And we, we're not going to ask people to lay their hands on it. But you can get up close mm. to this and have a real look at the detail. Um, the original is at Hampton Court Palace. It is. It's in the Royal Collection, uh, but it's um, displayed at Hampton Court Palace. Yeah. So one of the powers of exhibitions is that you can display things in different ways and give people different experiences. Um, I think that's all we have to say. Thank you so much for joining us on our little tour of our poor, yeah. sad, delayed exhibition. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, we're still really excited by what we've managed to achieve, and we're really excited to launch it when we can, and when we can come back to work. And we look forward to seeing you when we do. Yeah, please come. <laughs>